uh, first uh, report out that in a close, we had a closed session meeting. Uh, no action items were taken in, in closed session. So going from there, um, we will do the flag salute. And then after we do the flag salute, then we'll do the presentations from the uh, students. Okay. Okay. Salute pledge. Okay, we oh. Testing. Testing, testing. Ms. Simonich, could you please speak into the microphone? Testing, testing. Sorry, do I have to say it all again? <laughs> no. Oh, I don't know what I said. <laughs> Carolyn, testing. this is Carolyn Baker. She's um, going to, um, you're going to enjoy a performance from the Greer Handbells Choir. So I need to talk in the microphone. Okay, evidently Greer had handbells that when it was a middle school and they haven't been used for a long time. And, and at Christmas time, I was kind of exploring around the music room because I, I'm a supposed to be retired music teacher from Lodi and um, classroom music, I don't do band. So I started a piano group because I, so that way the kids could have some extra music. And I discovered this three octave set of handbells and I thought, Oh my goodness, these things are amazing. When I was teaching in Lodi, I had a chime, hand chime choir, which are beautiful, but they're not as expensive as the handbells. So I was very excited. So I um, mentioned it to um, our principal. And so we had to order all of the material before we could even start. So these girls have only been playing since the end of January, because we needed to have gloves, you don't touch the bells without gloves. We needed to get the, the gloves, I had foam pads from my chime group. So I donated some of my phone uh, pads, even though they're not the right ones, but they're okay for what we're doing now. We had to get folders and everything else. So I'm really proud of them. They only get to practice once a week. I wish I could practice with them every day because they're we have a lot of fun. Uh, the bells are just amazing. So they're gonna start out with the song called Corral. It's from the gates of Kiev by Masorsky from pictures of an exhibition. And so they're gonna start with that. And then their closing number is gonna be Stars and Stripes Forever by John Philip Sousa. <laughs>
Wow, that was amazing. Miss Baker and students, girls, you were amazing. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and sharing with us. Parents, thank you for bringing your, your young ladies here tonight to share with us. It was just amazing. Excellent, excellent job. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yes, we have a little treat bag for you as you're as you're heading out. And Kawhi, are we gonna do the tables after? Okay, we'll do the tables after. That light off? The spotlight? Is there, we have a, let's see if we can. <laughs> let's just say, I think it's right on. Pointed right at these two right here. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I can't remember. I was trying to remember. Mm, that's fine. So my great hair. Thank you, Koi. Thank you. It's going down. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. All right. So, did you want to go back up to who's the, next? Number the Wilderness Inquiry. Okay. Staff. So, we're just okay. back at number one. I'll okay. Thanks again for the Greer, for the bell ringing. We appreciate it. Excellent job. Excellent job, ladies. Girls, make sure you grab a little treat over here too. Yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Look how much they love Miss Baker. <laughs> that's great. Yes, I asked Kawhi to get pictures. Okay. So. Did you get pictures? Yes. Well, maybe we didn't get pictures of the flowers. Hey, uh, ladies, Greer, the handbell ladies, can we get a picture with, with you with uh, Mrs. Baker, please?
Nice. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thanks again, Greer. I appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll be moving on to uh, more reports. We'll go with the uh, wilderness inquiry staff. All right, thank you. Uh, that was fantastic, Greer. Hard to believe some of those same students were out paddling canoes last week. So <laughs> multi-talented Greer <laughs> students. But I am delighted to introduce the wilderness inquiry team. They have traveled from Minnesota and they've been here in Gulf this last two weeks. We were finishing up programming uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, over the two weeks, uh, we'll have had about 700 students, 25 classes, four school districts, and lots and lots of families out paddling on the preserve. So I will let Wilderness Inquiry introduce themselves. And we're gonna keep, I, I believe, a musical theme going tonight. <laughs> I will hand it over to them. Perfect. Hello. Hey, everybody. My name is Grace. I work for Wilderness Inquiry. So we are an organization, a nonprofit based in St. Paul, Minnesota. So we came all the way out here. Uh, it took us about three days to drive out here um, to take kids canoeing. So um, our mission, the nonprofit's mission, is to take people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities into the outdoors. Um, so we're lucky enough that we get to take people canoeing every day for our jobs. Um, as we do in the beginning of our welcome circles, I want to just take a moment to um, acknowledge the land that we are on. We are on the land of the Miwok people. Um, we want to just take a moment to thank them for their stewardship of this land um, and to continue to be stewards of the land ourselves. Um, so for us, that means we take care of it. We pick up trash when we see it, or we respect the plants, animals, and people around us. Um, and also for us, it looks like being grateful for the land that we get to appreciate and spend time in all the time and water. Um, yeah, so... Um, we'll have our staff introduce ourselves, and then Corey's going to kind of talk about what we do for Canoe Mobile, our program that we're doing out here. Um, and then we have a little, little surprise song for you all. Um, so my name's Grace. I use she, her pronouns. I am from Minnesota. Um, I'm from the Twin Cities area. And my favorite body of water is a little, a little lake up in northern Minnesota called Webb Lake, where my family rents a cabin every year, and I've just grown up going to. Testing, testing. Mm-hmm. Hi, my name is Corey. I'm from Duluth, Minnesota. I do she, her, parts of the Norway and that's the girls. And my favorite body of water is the Lake Future. Our Hi, everybody. My name is Cassie. I'm the program and I'm Madison. I'm here. 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 i Oh, 
Stuck inside. Stuck inside. Stuck inside. Nice, so strong. Uh, he said to me, I'll take a step. Do you do? I took a sip and he went down. I do my pipes. He lost the ground. He was my pal. He was my friend. He was my friend. He's gone. And that's him. One day I burned. Burn. And, and he came up. up. I did my eyes. I got it. I got it. <laughs> nice. That was fabulous. Uh, so there's a lot of fun on the boats. There's a lot of uh, new skills learned, a lot of confidence building, and then good tie-ins to science and the academics as well. So it's not just a play day. It's, it's an intensive full day of programming. So uh, this week the, and last week, too, the land stations, we had students fly casting. They were learning about aquatic invertebrates the basis of the food chain for the ducks and the fish that they see out at the preserve, doing a compass and orienteering course, and then a nature walk with a cultural history focus. So come on out. Uh, tomorrow is Valley Oaks and Lake Canyon on Friday. And it's just fun. We'll get you in a boat if you'd like. <laughs> we can do that. So just, just another thank you to the Wilderness Inquiry team. They've been amazing for two weeks. And then where are you off to next? Salt Lake City. All oh, right. Nice. Yeah. So thank you so much for all you do for students. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Yeah. Uh, actually, you guys are invited every year. Our kids oh. enjoy this. Uh, I'm, yeah. If you can be here every year, we'd love to have you here every year. Right? Yeah. And uh, John, thanks again. You're you're irreplaceable for what you do. You are. I love the John Galt. That is great. Yes. Right? That is that's him. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks thank you very much thank you john thank you wilderness inquiry thank you okay uh moving on uh go to galt character coalition i thought i saw mari mrs martinez and mrs roberts out there yes awesome I'd like to uh, yeah okay And we're here to present the Integrity Award uh, to Lake Canyon Elementary School. Oh. And I'll go ahead and read this. Do you want to come up, Ms. Hayes? Very fitting. They're also fitting. They're presenting too. <laughs> And this was what was stated by uh, the family that nominated Lake Canyon. For our family, Lake Canyon Elementary School is a true proponent and exemplary model of integrity in our Galt community. Having been involved as parents of children at Lake Canyon since 2011 until the present, we have had ample time and experience to recognize how integrity drives decisions at the school in every aspect. As an example, the house system that is implemented at Lake Canyon sets the tone for positive interactions among students across grade levels. Students learn what positive and respectful social interactions look like. Rather than taking a punitive approach, Lake Canyon uses a research-based restorative behavior approach to discipline. There is continual encouragement for students to do their best. The Lake Canyon House System allows smaller groups of students to interact and help each other. There is increased opportunities for students to see older students who are models of positive behavior and leadership. The positive attitudes of students toward one another and toward the school have increased as students learn that good character is promoted, promoted with integrity and expected as the norm throughout the school. While past practice may have focused mainly on reacting to student misbehavior with more punishment-based strategies, Research indicated that punishment in the absence of other positive strategies is not effective. The leadership, teachers, and all stakeholders at Lake Canyon took the bold steps necessary to implement this new positive behavior system. Each year, Lake Canyon renews its focus on positive behavior, integrity, and good character by continuing to implement the house system. Lake Canyon Elementary School, its leadership, teachers, staff, and students deserve recognition as true role models of integrity in our community. And they were nominated by Todd and Julie Jennings. So congratulations. Thanks. Well, thank you very much to the Galt Character, Character Coalition. And I'm so pleased that this happened this evening when I actually have some of my wonderful student leaders and families here to, to see us receive this. And on behalf of our amazing staff and parents and students, I thank you for this honor. It's very nice. Thank you.
Congratulations, Lake Canyon. Hey, uh, Judy, do you guys want to do a picture? We got the paper here and maybe get your students involved in, the, in that picture as well, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's on. She's online. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll move on. So move on to uh, item four here with a uh, day in the life of a teacher video with Christina Lowry. Right. So indeed.com, they highlight different careers and they did a, a segment called a day in the life of the teacher and Christina Lowry, a social studies teacher at McCaffrey Middle School, stepped up to help them and she created a video with them of her classroom and just really showing what it is like. Oh, we are going to be able to show it. I didn't think we were going to. Let's see. We had heard YouTube was not, that the city Wi-Fi was not letting YouTube come through. Um, it is on YouTube. Um, oh, you hear me, but that's. <laughs> Maybe we can. I am a U.S. history teacher. I teach eighth grade. We study from Columbus all the way through the Civil War and Reconstruction. I love teaching. I've been doing this 26 years, and I love the kids, and that's something really important. You've got to love the kids. I got my degree in criminal justice administration and a minor in political science. I joined a credential program. It was a fast-track program, nine months. And then in order to teach history, since I have a degree in something else, I had to take three CSET. And once you pass those tests, then you get the credential to be able to teach that. Every morning I come in and write down the agenda so the kids can look up here and know exactly what is expected of them. We have five minute passing period. So to clean up from one class, get the kids out, bring the next group in and be prepared. It goes really fast. So I'm trying to get ahead of the game and be prepared for first period already. Hi, dear. How are you? Good. Nice sweatshirt. Go Giants. So who are we talking about today? It's a person. No, it's not a pirate. We are studying George Washington. I want three Ks. What do you know about Washington? I want three Ws. What questions do you still have? And leave the L's blank, okay? I chose this job mainly because I love history, but secondly, I had a teacher in high school that was so engaging and just really cared about the kids and it inspired me the same thing. And this is the best profession I could have chosen. They make my life extremely fulfilled. And it's nice to think of them as my own little kids. First of all, what is foreign? When we say foreign policy from a different country. Yeah. So how did Washington deal with different countries? That's what you're looking for. So students are getting ready to play a review game based on information that they've learned about George Washington in the last few days and what they're doing at their stations right now. They are going to be engaged, they're going to be competitive, they're going to be excited, and I look forward to seeing how well they do on the game. All right, is that true or false? Did he chop down the cherry tree? Tell me, tell me, I think that's true. Well, you guys have a job, most of you. 
But when it comes to lesson plans, I'm really looking at student ability. My students are sitting in groups. And I try and mix up the ability level so different students might be able to encourage or help those that maybe are struggling. All right, perfect times. What is the average salary of a U.S. teacher? The answer will be coming up later in this video. Got to be a great communicator. Got to be able to have conversations with the students and get down to their level and their understanding. And there's always a quote I think about that students don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think that's the biggest thing that I try and live by is establishing a good rapport with my students because once they know I care about them, I've got them engaged. The students are getting ready for their annual eighth grade Washington DC field trip. I am so looking forward to seeing your faces of all the things that we've learned about in class and just really excited to bring Washington DC to life. When it comes to field trips, it's so important to enhance the students' learning by actually going and visiting these places. And you get to know the students on a different level. So it's really important for kids to get into a new environment and to be right there with their teacher and enjoying it together. This should be interesting. We don't usually go outside and do these activities, so this is one of those days we're just gonna experiment a little bit. It's important to continue your education as a teacher because there's new techniques that come out. There's new discussions about what works in the classroom. There's changing things in the education field, strategies that you can learn. And it's always important to change things up. So life is not over at three o'clock for a teacher. It's just beginning actually, because now I'm focused on what am I doing tomorrow? I've got to go make my copies, grade a few papers, but I really tried hard to balance out my work life and my personal life. So I try to not take work home with me as much as possible. Another challenge would be students that are exhibiting some behaviors that are disruptive to class. Trying to help that student that isn't motivated. But just know flexibility, energy, and patience are key to the teaching profession. I know this was the place I was meant to be because those relationships down the road and those kids coming back and talking to me and telling me about their lives and the role that I played in it, there's nothing more important than that. It is a rewarding job for sure, but you gotta love it. You have to have your heart into this profession. And it will benefit not only you, but your students as well. So if you're interested in the teaching profession, you have to get a degree. It doesn't have to be an education degree. Then you're probably gonna want to substitute. So you're gonna need to take the CBES test. Once you pass that, substitute it elementary, middle, and high school and see how well you like it. If you're ready to move on, then go find yourself a credential program and you'll do your student teaching and you're on your way to looking for a job on the teaching profession. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. I believe Mrs. Lowry is online with us. Sorry, the sound is not the best. We're, I'll maybe wait for that to turn down. We were just glad we were able to show the video at first. Um, we weren't able because YouTube was blocked, but we could show the video. And I did want to thank Indeed also donated some money, I believe about $1,500 that will go to the social studies department for Mrs. Lowry's time for doing this video for them. on the she, I believe is she still on zoom is she with us electronically okay yeah she is do you have any questions for her or anything you got her on that's enough I was just uh thanks Miss Lowry appreciate that video very insightful thank you so much hopefully recruit some teachers to the mm -hmm. teaching profession mm -hmm. We'll move on. Number five, the Lake Canyon Elementary video. Yes, so it was Lake Canyon's month, representing our schools each month at our board meetings. Thank you, Mrs. Hayes and our students from Lake Canyon. Yes. 
All righty. Oh, what a fun night for Lake Canyon. And so when our superintendent invited the principals to bring student presentations, for me, it was really tough to decide because there's such a, a wide variety of amazing things happening on our campus across so many different domains. And so I thought, it might be fun just to give you a glimpse into our Lake Canyon culture. And so I have some amazing sixth graders here, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They're each going to speak to a component or an aspect of our Lake Canyon culture, including our house system that you heard a little bit about earlier. I'm going to set the stage for that before I let each of them come up with just an excerpt from our Lake Canyon mission. And the word that I hope that you grab a hold of this evening that's important to, to us at Lake Canyon is simply the word opportunities. The mission of Lake Canyon Elementary is to personalize the learning of each and every one of our students through the provision of a quality and meaningful educational experience built upon access to unique and varied opportunities, especially for our students who normally would not have access to these opportunities because of their socioeconomic, limited English or language, limited English language or disability status. And so tonight we've prepared a multimedia presentation. There's going to be a video playing behind us with some soft music, giving you glimpses into our school culture as the students speak. So I'm going to invite our first student speaker, Cody. Okay. Good evening. My name is Cody Robinson, and I'm a sixth grader at Lake Canyon. I'm a proud member of the House of Adabu, which is the House of Integrity. Through our Lake Canyon House system, the students of our campus have had the chance to connect with other members of our campus community that are in other grades or members of our school staff who may not have otherwise had the chance to interact with. The Lake Canyon House system provides us the opportunity to learn and practice important character traits and life lessons in a fun setting. We have house meetings where we practice citizenship values, do team building activities, create and practice house chants, and support and lift up each other. At our house rallies, our entire school comes together in our multi-purpose room to celebrate accomplishments which build our whole school community. We do our house roll call and play fun minute to win it games. Just last week, we had a house meeting themed around the house of Mallory, which is the house of visionaries. Through this activity, the students in each house gathered in groups and created these clouds you have, displaying, citing some of their dreams of what our community could look like in 10 years. Good evening. My name is Olive Gorlick and I'm a sixth grader at Lake Canyon. I'm a proud member of the House of Lokihi, which is the House of Compassion. Through the longstanding opportunities in our after school cougar clubs, the students of Lake Canyon have the chance to further participate in and explore their areas of interest. Every trimester, our school offers around 10 to 12 different clubs. These clubs are super fun and are usually led by committed community partners, parents, or our amazing Lake Canyon staff members. We have after school clubs with many different focus areas, such as culinary cooking clubs, culture clubs, science and engineering clubs, community service clubs, team building and friendship clubs, art clubs, sports clubs, and academic competition clubs. I've personally participated in the chess club, which is super fun and you can enjoy even if you don't have much experience. I was also part of the girls basketball team. I have happy memories of winning with the girls basketball team and interacting with friends on the basketball court as well as the chess club. Good evening. My name is Ali Schmidt and I'm a sixth grader at Lake Canyon. I'm a proud member of the House of Sabete, which is the House of Courage. I love and appreciate the caring teachers and staff at Lake Canyon. I've attended Lake Canyon since I was in kindergarten and I have so many amazing teachers over the years, such as Mrs. Woods, Mrs. Garcia, Mrs. Kahn, Mrs. Mobley, Mr. Sheldon, Mrs. Trinman, and Mrs. Scott. These teachers have helped me in so many ways and made learning fun and engaging. 
I remember this year when I really started to become more of a leader. Also this year, I started leading and helping with the house meetings. Every day, I look forward to coming to Lake Canyon, and I love starting my day as a member of our school spirit team, who leads our opening ceremony every morning on the outdoor stage beginning at 7.30 a.m. We play fun music as kids and their parents arrive and play together on our yard. When the morning bell sounds, we lead the entire school together as they are lined up on our yard in an encouraging chant. We give a shout out to the house who has their flag flying that day because they're in the lead with house points and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. My name is Ruby Gorlick and I'm a sixth grader at Lake Canyon. I'm a proud member of the House of Adabu, which is the House of Integrity. I appreciate the opportunities I have had over the years in working with so many incredible community partners. For example, Coach Tony has come to our campus every Tuesday and Thursday for many years and leads fun chess senior and chess junior clubs. He is so caring and always encourages us to do our best and never give up. For many years, Coach John Hall has come to our campus and led a lunchtime sports program. Over the years, he has trained and supported many of us to be leaders in his sports stations. We also have several dads on duty like Mr. Ward, who also comes to Lake Canyon almost every day to play basketball, throw a football, or play soccer with us. Mark Stockman and his beautiful Golden Retriever Bentley have also come to Lake Canyon every week to practice reading with our younger students. Community partners such as Lisa Klotz from Cal Waste, the Gulf Police Community Service Officers, Dr. Jen from the Science Alliance, and a group of Spanish-speaking parents who lead a fun culinary cultural club on our campus are also examples of meaningful community partners we appreciate who make Lake Canyon a special place to learn and prepare for our futures. So as you can see, we have so many amazing things happening at Lake Canyon, and I'd like to invite each and every one of you to come and take a tour and experience some of those wonderful things. So thank you, and thank you to our student leaders. Great job. And uh, to talk about that. excellent job, great presentations, yeah. great speaking skills, awesome. Wonderful job, students. And thank you, parents, for bringing your students out tonight. Love hearing about your school. Thanks again. Have a good night. Parents, thank you for bringing thank your Thank you. Appreciate it. Moving on to uh, school calendars. All right, our administrators will highlight just one event coming up in May. We will start with, I'll skip Lake Canyon because Judy stepped out, We um, Marengo Ranch, Mrs. Porter. On the 17th, we have our Open Town Round and Open House. Thank you. River Oaks, Mrs. Hamdis. Hi. So, uh, okay. Um, this month, we have a lot going on uh, along with our picnic on the grounds. Uh, we're having the open house after, but our on May 30th, we are celebrating with parents and students of sixth grade, and we're having a really fun staff versus students softball game. So, yes. Awesome. And we have Valley Oaks. I know Mrs. Marquez is with us online. Let's see if she, would you like me to go to another school while we're getting her online? How about Greer Elementary, Mrs. Simonich? Good evening. If you would like to join us for, oh, let's, oh, our talent show. We have a talent show on the 11th. It should be really fun. Thank you. And Fairsight Preschool Readiness Elementary Center, um, Mrs. Najar. 
we have, is this happening? It's actually kind of hard to find it and just pick one uh, event, but I'm just going to highlight the last day of preschool, which is May 24th. We have our annual color run. All right, thank you. And we have McCaffrey Middle School, which is probably Miss Niger also. Yes. <laughs> yes. And again, I had a whole list of things I was going to highlight, but um, <clears throat> I, was, I think um, the open house that we have scheduled for May 11th, um, our intent is to have it as more of a showcase. And so we will have um, presentations from band, choir, color guard, and then um, we will have our classrooms and departments open for families to visit with some departments having some hands-on activities for parents to participate in. All right, thank you. Is Mrs. Marquez with us? All right. Can Laura, go ahead. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening. Uh, next month at Valley Oaks um, on the 26th of May from six to seven is our art night. And uh, this event started way back into uh, 2016. And every single student has a piece of art on display because every single classroom participates. And so parents come with their fan, with their children, look at the art, but then there are several hands-on art activities that students can actually do and take with them. And then in conjunction with our PTO, um, we raffle off um, art kits, art supplies, various types of art kits. Um, every 15 minutes must be present to win. And it's just a good time for everybody. Parents do art with the kids. So it's it's a hands-on time and then just a time to appreciate um, everybody's art on display. Thank you, Mrs. Marquez. Mrs. Hayes, do you wanna highlight just one activity in May? Thank you. On um, May 30th is the annual Lake Canyon Color Run. And every year we adopt five or six local, regional, and even national nonprofit groups. And we turn around most of the proceeds from that event back out to those nonprofits. And um, the students are very aware of who they're running to support and raising pledges for. And it's a very high energy, fun annual event at Lake Canyon. Thank you. I probably now that we that concludes our presentation our, and our recognition before we get into reports, I should go ahead and do the board meeting protocol. All right, so our session is being recorded and it is open to the public and also being broadcast live through Zoom teleconference. To make public comment, the comments are three minutes per agenda item and the board shall limit total time for public comment for each agenda item to 20 minutes. With board consent, the board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comment. To make a comment via Zoom, uh, notify the board meeting assistant through the chat box feature in Zoom or by using the raised hand feature in Zoom for the agenda item to be addressed and you will be identified by your display name and when called upon to speak. To make public comment in person, there's public comment cards um, there at the doors and that would go to Ms. Bach, our board meeting assistant. Email public comments are emailed to the superintendent 24 hours before the board meeting, and they would be posted on our website. Um, we have not received um, email public comments for tonight. Board vote and connectivity. Each motion will be followed by a roll call vote for action items. Should a board member attend the meeting remotely or we lose connectivity by teleconference or phone, the meeting would be displayed um, delayed five minutes and regular meetings shall be adjourned by 1030. Going from there, we're on item F, public comments. Is there any public comments? No, Mr. Cagle, there are no public comments at this time. We'll move on to G, which is reports. LCAP goal number one. All right, we have our district reading assessments, our director of curriculum, Cleo Del Toro and Guiano. Thank you. So the data you see on the screen is the same data that you have in your binders. Um, tonight, we are sharing with you the district reading assessment results. 
Um, the district reading assessment, the DRAs, uh, they measure foundational reading skills. It allows our district to monitor how well students are moving towards becoming independent readers um, by the end of third grade. The DRA is administered to all students in kinder through third grade, three times a year. We have an LCAP goal of wanting to see a 10% growth with student cohorts or student groups from winter to winter. And that 10% target really pushes us uh, closer to reaching at least 80% um, of the children reading at grade level by the end of third grade. So that's how that 10% came about. So let's take a look at the data. We'll start with current sixth grade. Uh, as a district, the current first grade, I said sixth grade, sorry. The current first grade students, 66% of them met or exceeded all the DRA targets this past winter. That same group last year as kinder, 52% of them had met all the DRA targets, which means this group or cohort did reach, exceeded that 10% target. That's how the data reads. So if we take a look at the current second grade, 53% of them met the targets, same group last year, 48%. Although we saw growth, we didn't meet the 10% growth target that we have in our LCAP. Um, our current third grade at 67%, last year at 45, they obviously exceeded the 10% target. The next data sets are each individual school following the same pattern of looking at the current score and comparing that to last year's cohort. So if we take a look, the first school is Greer. The current first and third grade group reached or exceeded that 10% target. We go to the next school. Thank you, Kawhi. I think the previous there, thank you. Lake Canyon, third grade met or exceeded that 10%. At Moranga Ranch, we have second and third grade. Um, if you see the growth from second to third, obviously they exceeded that 10% target. At River Oaks, third grade, met or exceeded the target. On the next data sets, Kauai, we have Valley Oaks, we have first and third grade that met that 10% uh, target. The last chart is not in your packet, but we thought this would be a, a good visual to show you with just the yes, no, who made it, who did not. Um, keep in mind that we saw growth, but if they if grade levels and cohorts didn't reach that 10%, we indicated that as a no. So it doesn't mean they didn't grow, they just didn't hit the 10% that we wanted to see. So something interesting for you to look at is this last column. What do you notice with third grade for every single school? Yeah. No, increased. And I was going to, uh, one of the things I noticed is the second to third, it's a huge jump. It's not just like a 10%. It's anywhere from like, look like 12 to about yes. 20 something percent. Yes. So what this indicates that third grade, it really shows you that we are on the right path. We are moving in the right direction with having at least 80% of the children at the end of third grade. And again, this is not the end of third, but they've already met that 10%, but our goal is to have at least 80% of the children reading at grade level by the end of third grade. Um, right now, I would say Marengo is sitting at 73% of them, as you can see on the other charts, but every single school is at or above 60%. So we're in, we're in good shape. I think this is a reflection of how hard teachers are planning, teaching, uh, doing small group, attending professional development, asking good questions. They had some great um, PDSA um, action plans. It's also a reflection of the leadership that you have in front of you. It's um, coming off a pandemic, and I know it sounds like it's been a while, but we're still feeling the results of that. And to see these types of results it really speaks to the dedicated group of, of teachers that you have, as well as classified staff who support reading in, in classrooms. 
Any thoughts, any questions with the data points, data sets? Uh, I'll start. One of the things I noticed is almost every single group increased. Um, it's, for, it's very, it's good to see, to see those results. Uh, I said, uh, uh, you're just one group that didn't, but I mean, they declined by 3%, but everything else is, is an improvement, whether it be 1% all the way up to looks like about 23, 24%. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good stuff that is that is going on in our schools. Yeah. Yes. It's hard work. Teachers are doing a fantastic job. Okay. Thank you so much. Just want to say very proud of all the hard work. Your teachers classified again, everyone administrators. It's just it's so great to see that our students are making growth this year. It's so important that they're reading on grade level when they by the time they leave third grade. And so it's just a lot of hard work. Very proud of our staff and our students. Okay. Thank you for the report. Uh, we'll move on. We'll go to uh, commendation classes. All right. Um, at board um, direction, we've prepared a report for you on combination classes. So we have shared with you why combination classes are formed, and it's really based on enrollment. Um, we try to, well, for one, we, of course, we implement class size reduction in grades TK3. Our goal is 20 to 1. If we go at 21 or over 21, our teachers are paid a monthly stipend. Um, currently, right now, in our classes for uh, TK to third grade, we have anywhere from a class size of 15 up to 23. We do have a couple classes across the district that have 23 students. Most are around um, 18 to 21. We have a few that are 15, 16, 17 across the district, um, but we really we, we try to keep class sizes lower, of course, in primary. We also need to provide reasonable class sizes in grades four through six. And looking at current enrollment, class sizes range from 27 students in a class to 33 students in a class. We also have to consider the district budget. And we also have to accommodate for declining enrollment or sometimes it's increased enrollment that causes um, combo classes. What I've prepared for you on page two is just a history of combination classes in our district. We went as far back as 2016-17. 16-17 um, and 17-18, we had two combo classes in the district. In 18-19, we had four. There was a little bit of a spike of enrollment there. We had 3,600 kids that year. And then from 2019 to 2022, we had one combo class. Currently this year, we have four combo classes and it's mainly due to declining enrollment. We only have 3,365 3, students. So it is a, a drop of over 200 students from 18, 19, back when we had four combo classes there as well. And so what's happening right now is with declining enrollment, we don't have enough students to have three full fourth, fifth, sixth grade classes is ideally what we would like to have. Um, it's increased enrollment when we have four or we have more students than we can fill for three. Sometimes that happens. We're not in that case right now. But so what ends up happening is we have two for example, I'll say fourth and fifth grade. We have two full fourth grade classes, two full fifth grade classes, and then we have a combo four or five is what happens. Um, we try to keep, you know, we look at the numbers. If we have an intermediate class where if we add a teacher, we'll have 25, 26, 27 students in a class. Okay, we'll add a teacher. But if it looks like we're going to be under 24 in an intermediate class, then we try to, we, we probably will have a combo. And so what's projected at this time are three combo classes. Um, since the last board meeting, we did add two classes. We added a class at Marengo and we added a class at Valley, but it still didn't alleviate the need for a combo class, but it did get class sizes down. It got it down, but there's still a, a four or five combo and maybe a five, is it five, six at Marengo? I can't remember. We're still looking at a, a combo and in, in intermediate, both of those, those school sites. Um, it's not 
um, you know, in, in many cases, combo classes are, are not ideal. We don't go out of our way to try to make combo classes. We, we would love to be able to fill a, a class at 20, 30 students or even, you know, a little under. Um, but that's just, it's the reality of what we're, what we're facing right now. Um, again, we do, we have contract language where we pay teachers um, extra stipend for going over those class sizes. And we do have language that combination teachers receive a an yearly stipend for the extra work that we know that goes into being a combination teacher. Yes, any, any questions from the board on combination classes? Um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tracy. You go, you go. How do you go about, um, or I guess the admin at the site, mm -hmm. choosing, do teachers volunteer for it? Um, if they're volunteer and then the combo class, you have more enrollment, do they get to pick if they're doing, you know, say it was a fourth, fifth, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, our numbers went up. Like, how does that all work mm -hmm. with the teachers? Well, sometimes we do have teachers that volunteer to teach combos. We do. We have some teachers in our district that historically have taught combo classes for multiple years, maybe not every year. Um, and then we follow contract language for teachers when we open up a new class or if we close a class on how we they get to move. And so um, in some cases, if we you know, and a lot of times there are volunteers too. We will ask for volunteers, but we do have to follow contract language. If we say we have a four or five class right now and say numbers increase, and we might be able to fill, add a teacher and fill classes. Um, Cleo, could you just comment on what, how contract language, what we would do in that case? Typically we look at the least senior in a grade level. If there are no volunteers and if that teacher is then selected to become the combination teacher. Teachers at, at each PLC, they do a really good job of trying to decide, you know, what's um, what's best for the children, what's best for the PLC, how do they make it work? It's not an easy decision to make. Uh, it really takes a additional planning time to make a combination class work. Um, the teacher has to be able to plan and, and know the difference between the standards. Um, so it's, it's, it's a challenging assignment um, that can also provide a lot of highlights because you do end up with uh, children at different ages being a little more creative, um, but, but it is a, a challenging assignment to, to fill. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so I'm looking here because I know it was brought up before about how the students are chosen and you have the criteria here for how they're chosen. So my 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 question is, say that um, you decided on a combo, you have these students selected, what what type of parent input is there to say if their child gets, can, you know, because maybe I don't want my child in a combo class but maybe Tracy was fine with hers. Are we involved in that in that decision-making process as well? As I, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our principals. My understanding is that um, families are notified that they have been assigned, that the child has been assigned to a combination class. And there has been times in which admin will take that input and will either move children in or out um, of the classroom. Any... Um, I think Jennifer, you've you've had that where you let the families know ahead of time. We do. We let them know ahead of time, and sometimes there's a lot of um, talking about it to convince them that yes, this can actually work. Um, it's it's not an easy position to fill. Combo classes are are challenging, but um, we've tried to put kids in there that can do some unique things together. Maybe they a, a gate group of kids, so we can do some. Mm -hmm. different types of things and there that we can do that we can't really do in another class. And we also have parents that look forward and who will request a combo, combo class. And so it, it's really depends on the experience of the child, the experience of that family. 
But yes, there, there is movement once the families are notified. And there's sometimes we have teachers that request to teach a combo class. We had that situation at Lake Canyon this year. We had had a combo class slated and looking at numbers, we decided to close it and we moved a teacher somewhere else. And the teacher mm -hmm. said, I was ready. I wanted to teach the combo. So it's just, you, you hear both sides. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's so since sort of the, the topic came up, sort of trying to educate myself on the whole thing. And that was sort of what I was landing. You know, there was different perspectives, some pluses, some minuses. Um, it seems like if you eliminate the combo classes, it's sort of like you push something down, something else pops up. So then is that, you know, where's sort of all the prioritization and the outcomes and the results? So, um, but I don't, I do know that there was some comments last month with regards to the combo classes and sort of some concerns that were expressed and things like that. One being with regards to the um, honor roll. So it would be interesting to see if that's, you know, um, if there's uh, not honor roll, but like the ones that get recognized are usually in the combo classes and then sometimes the other classes are not. But um, so it'd be interesting to see that pattern just sort of in the data, how that played out. But um, I did also notice that um, because it does seem like something where if you make smaller class sizes, then there's some other, you know, either a cost or, uh, you know, a budgetary um, item. So I did notice that in the later topic that we're getting to sort of that sunshine letter, I did see combo classes on there. So perhaps some of the concerns and things can be, I'm guessing, work through that process um, and sort of see how everything plays out with regards to the overall picture. So but I'll continue to learn and educate myself. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you for this. And thank mm -hmm, you for the opportunity. So we have a speaker, Kim, you have to come up and. Hi, good evening. Um, Kim Lizama, sixth grade teacher at Valley Oaks. Um, I was one of the people who spoke last month about combo classes, um, and I wasn't necessarily going to speak today, but we knew what that this was on the agenda and wanted to be here to address any anything that came up that we felt like needed to be um, addressed. Um, and the only thing I would say is that I'm glad that it's come up. I'm glad you're talking about it. I'm glad you're asking about it. I'm glad that Lois pulled together some information and data for you. And I would just encourage that. I would encourage you to ask lots of questions about it, get the data. I feel like last time's um, conversation really helped to get eyes on the problem and solved it in a couple places where it could be. Um, and I don't think any of us are asking for classes of 15 kids to make this work. We're asking for really reasonableness. Um, there was a GEFA meeting where some teachers discussed the fact that if the combos at their school were dismantled, each class would still have like 27 kids. It was very reasonable, not worth having combos for it all. So I just wanted to tell you that I appreciate you going back and looking at it and at least pulling back a couple of them where you saw that the numbers um, would make that work. Um, I would like to see them all pulled back. I'm not against 15 kids in a class at all, but I understand that that's not really financially feasible, but I would like you to, um, I'm, I'm glad that you did this and I would just like you to keep looking at it and, and being really um, um, specific about your questions and feel free to ask any teachers your questions, especially teachers who've taught combo classes or taught the adjacent classes to the combo classes. Thank you, appreciate your time. Thank you, Kim. And we are, we're, we're looking at numbers closely and if we would love for it to work out that we have some more kids come in or there's some movement to where we can close the three that are projected and, and have straight classes. Okay. So we'll watch that. Also that uh, Lois is, is doing an exceptional job of really looking at the numbers and it's not a, okay, we've decided we move on next item. It should really is keeping track of what do the numbers look like and can we can we shift? Can we pivot? What can we do? So it's know that it's um she's looking at the numbers constantly to see if if anything else can be done rather than um to have a, a combination classroom. Yeah. And it takes next, a lot of time. Yeah. Well, we do clear health. Kauai is really good at this too, but we just accepted school of choice. And so we're waiting for the intent forms are due Friday. And then once that done and synergies kind of leveled out with movement and school of choice, we're going to look at it again next week to see if anything shifted to where we can 
maybe we need to open something up. So. Um, my other question, I'm just sort of thinking about this. So say you begin the year, the combo class starts, and then two or three months into the school year, more students come in, right? So will you, I'm obviously guessing, right, you would go ahead and divide them and make two. Yes, we class. can. It's been a long time since we've had to do that, but I, I can recall having to do that, open up a class in September or October. Mm-hmm. It rarely happens, but again, because Lois is keeping track of the numbers, she's also projecting ahead. Mm -hmm. So there's room, for example, at Marengo in certain grade levels, knowing that of other grade levels at different schools are already kind of reaching their, their cap. So she's projecting ahead to avoid mm -hmm. what you're describing. Yeah, we, we're trying to keep numbers lower at least at one school or one grade level on each side so if we get to the point to where we're going to fill we could uh, might have to say okay now you have to go to a different school um but we're we're, we're watching it the best we can i know it's ever changing if someone could come the day before school starts mm -hmm. but is there kind of a general time usually that you have everything settled as far as the numbers? Um, you know, I think TK and kinder probably are the hardest because you just never know. And it looks like TK is going up a little bit. We had 71 as of today. And so um, might need five. We're hoping we will have five there. We'll see right now we have four, but that we might pull the trigger on that and open a, a fifth class at TK. Um, you know, I think this is a big window right now once School of Choice gets finalized because most of the numbers in your first through eighth grade are going to be pretty solid after School of Choice. Um, we're not expecting any huge developments to come up, you know, during the summer. Um, so I, th I think within the next week or two, our numbers, at least through first through eighth grade, should be pretty solid. Good. Thanks for all the information. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other, any other questions? Everybody good? Okay. Um, I just want to say that over the years, um, I've weathered multiple combination classrooms with my children, and this, the teacher did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really wasn't for it in the beginning, but by the, you know, the kids did not, I felt like they did not suffer at all. And as a parent, I, it, the year always went really well. I really, as a parent, I didn't really even see a negative at the end of the year. The biggest thing was when they had their recess, was it with their, which grade level was which recess? That was really the biggest issue of the entire year was recess, not really the academics. And if anything, I felt, um, you know, they came out great, but it was just, I don't know, it was a positive experience. It wasn't negative. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, okay, well, no more questions and then comments. We'll we'll move on to uh, uh, other reports because there is no LCAP number two, right? So yes. So we have Lori Ranieri from Government Financial Strategies Joint Powers Authority with you tonight. This is she's going to present an overview of funding of our school facilities, and I know some of you have remember Lori and have met Lori and and her dog, but this is not Daisy. This is a new service dog. Well, by way of introduction, uh, that was Millie shaking herself off of the <laughs> nap that she was having. So my dog Daisy came here many times and she died a couple, about a, uh, two years ago, I guess now from, uh, not from COVID, but during COVID. And um, I was home. I didn't think I'd get another service dog, but you know what? The world has opened back up and people want me to come to, to school board meetings and I get rewarded with the kind of inspiration that you have in your meeting. And I will say, I think most school board members have actually not been in a school board meeting in any other district than their own. And your meetings are always very inspiring. 
Um, I always enjoy coming here. I enjoy all the school board meetings I go to, but I never know what I'm going to see here. And that handbell <laughs> display was totally unexpected. And so then I thought, okay, that was fantastic. And then we had these young people getting us all up singing a song about a worm. So that was very impressive. <laughs> and then the, the, the students with the different houses and the values and the ethics, I mean, it's just overwhelming. And then you get back to my area with the quant and how well the students are doing. And um, it, there's a reason that I, I go all over the state and I always talk to people about, have you ever heard of GALT? Um, because nobody has, but look at what, what you're doing here. You know, um, It's a real model for, for school districts. So I, I feel honored that we're a part of your team. And um, I thank the superintendent for mentioning our joint powers authority, which is new. And you are one of our um, early members. And we do we did change the name a little bit. It's the Government Financial Services Joint Powers Authority because we are expanding our services and we're taking suggestions about what people want us to do, but we're staying in the area of government finance. So we're not getting into custodial services, but um, there's just a lot of things in school business that come up periodically for school districts. And, you know, with the turnover in school staff and stuff, it's like, well, nobody remembers who did that five years ago. So we're figuring out what, what we'll be doing. But one of the things we've always worked with you on is on facilities finance. And for those of you who don't know, our private company, Government Financial Strategies, Inc., actually competed to work with you and was selected through a request for proposal process, which I did not want to apply for. The County Office of Education called and said, you need to get involved with this district. I'm like, I'm so busy. I don't have time. I don't need another client, blah, blah, blah. And they said, we want you to respond to this request for proposal. So we did. We were selected. And I just feel like it was some weird kind of match that worked out beautifully. So we love being part of your team. And thank you for that. And we've really enjoyed getting to know Nicole since she has come on and taken the reins of the school business side of things. So that's, that's where our interest lies. So thank you for including us. And um, in case you're wondering about Millie, everybody always asks, she's 10 months old, training to be my seizure alert dog, which is what my other dog did for me. And um, she is 10 months and she is 65 pounds. So that is quite a large dog. That was not clear when she was adopted because she is a mutt. But she did come from the Great Pyrenees Rescue Group, so that was a clue. And um, but she was actually selected because they thought she specifically would be good with the tasks that I need, which is a learning to my seizures. And she's very calm, and she's doing very well in school. And so um, maybe I should uh, suggest to the service dog school that they can come here to learn about teacher training. But <laughs> um, no, Millie's doing great. So onto the business at hand, it, it's getting late and you have other things to do. So why am I here? We're gonna click to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Millie wants me to introduce Celestial Thomas. This is my assistant. <laughs> and um, you haven't met her before, but uh, she drives me because of my seizure condition. I don't drive around. So um, she comes with me and I'm gonna let Millie go sit with Auntie Celestial because I think she'll be happier. <laughs> Now I'll get to the business at hand. Um, I've covered a lot of other topics, but the thing that we help you with is funding facilities. And, you know, it's been a long time and there's new people. So we thought we would just kind of review things and I'll do it quickly uh, given the hour, but happy to slow down if there's something you want to stop and talk about. So we're going to talk about what's been done in the past. We're going to talk about looking at the future and then we'll talk about some next steps. So we'll go to the next slide. And, the primary sources that we we have facilities funds have been uh, Fund 21, our building fund, and what goes in there is the money from our bond measures. So the district had a bond measure in 2001 and 2016 that were successful, and we, we got money. I'm going to go into more detail, but we got funds for facilities. Then we also collect developer fees, and so that goes into Fund 25, and then um, we have the county school facilities fund, and that's the state school facilities program fund 35. So when we apply to the state and we get money, that's where that goes. And then we have the capital projects fund for blended component units um, fund 49, and that relates to our community facilities district fund. So almost everything that you could be doing that any school district could be doing to fund facilities you're doing. Um, 
and you've done a lot of different things. And I think a lot of this has to do with the development over time of the community. So CFDs were very popular 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So you were involved in that as well. And the geo bonds, you both of yours have come um, post the 55% voter approval change where you can now do a school bond 55%. So you've been doing all the things that you can do. And we'll go to next page four. You've had tremendous support from the voters um, on both Measure W and Measure K. And I will say, um, not that I'm supposed to be talking about the general fund, but I would say when you see this kind of voter approval and you're in declining enrollment, so that really affects your funding, it does make you think about a parcel tax, which requires a two-thirds vote because you do have the community support out there for, for measures. Now, I will say what plays against community support is I my own personal opinion, not technical opinion, is gas prices. When people drive by the gas station and they see the gas prices going up, it doesn't make them so excited about spending more on schools. But my position is if we spend more on schools, everything else will be better. So um, we'll go to the next page. And this is, we call this our little debt dashboard. And it just shows us what we have outstanding, our sources of debt, um, our geo bonds, and we're paying those down. But one thing that's kind of neat is that Measure W is going to be paid down um, over the next three years. So that's a nice thing to be thinking about and let the community know that they're paying that debt back. And um, and there's really no remaining authorization, no new funding available from that. And we'll go to the next page. And just in case um, you weren't sure how those tax rates are established to pay back those bonds, by law, the county is required to, to determine the tax rate and tax at whatever level is necessary to pay back the bonds. And that's why we call it a general obligation bond, meaning it's a general obligation of the tax base. And the rough math is that you take the debt service due every year and you divide it by the assessed values of all the properties and everybody pays their pro rata share. And um, I used to take it for granted that people knew this, but as we get further and further away from 1978, I'm not sure everybody does know, which is that assessed values for, for houses in a neighborhood can really vary widely because it has to do with the price at which the home was purchased and then the subsequent increases since then. Your assessed value can never go up at more than 2% with a year passage unless you've improved the home or you had a reduction and you're catching up. So if ever you have a phone call or a citizen says, oh, my, my assessed value went up by more than 2%, there's something going on there. And if somebody has a question, we can look it up and we can help them understand, as can the county. So if you ever get one of those, what I call grocery store question, um, we want people to have information and we can help them. So don't, don't be shy about letting us know. Let's go to the next page, because I think when you see this particular chart, it's really striking because you see the recession is marked in a circle there. And then you see that, that the recovery from the recession for our assessed values in our tax base took nine years. So we were well out of the recession before we saw the assessed value come back to where it was. And then look at the growth that we've had. So, um, you know, I don't want to predict anything negative happening, but I look at this trend and I look at something else, which is that two-year treasuries are higher than 10-year treasuries, which is an inverted yield curve. And for those of you who like economics, you know that that is one of the indicators that tells us the market thinks a recession may be on the horizon. Usually when we have that particular economic condition, it is um, about a year out. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a perfect prediction and that the future always has to resemble the past, but we're keeping our eye on that closely. We don't assume that, you know, like housing prices will continue to rise because it's when housing prices rise really rapidly, people sell those houses, then they come on the roll um, at that higher value. Say, for example, my house, I've lived in it a very long time. There's like buried value there, right? I, I'm still paying an assessed value based on when I bought it decades ago, and at some point they're going to carry me out of that house in a box, and the 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 county will say, "Oh my gosh, we finally got this assessed value back on the roll." So um, anyway, but I do want to say, if there's any citizen that has a question or you have a question, we're happy to research that and find out. And the other thing I will say is. Nobody likes their individual property be talked about in public. So we answer those questions privately. You know, we don't say, oh, my neighbor's house, you know, we'll be glad to, but we'll be glad to answer questions. So let's go to the next page. And then these are our tax levies. And we've been well under 
um, what we projected, except that first year, and that was a glitchy thing with the county. Um, we try to put that back in the rearview mirror. Um, so the tax rates have been um, certainly on average been below what we expected. And you can see every year they've been below the, the, the target rate. Now we don't control that. We sold the bonds and then the county does it. So all we did was model it and we try to work with them and, and hopefully get it done um, the way we want. Um, now that's measure W. Let's look at measure K. And measure K, we really, I wasn't around for measure W. Measure K, we worked a lot with the county to make sure that they got the tax rates where we wanted so we didn't have that rise. And um, and you can see they've been dropping. Now, why? They're pretty stable, but why have they been dropping? They've been dropping because our tax base is growing faster than we modeled it to grow, right? I showed you it's really gone up and we didn't assume that we would get that um, big increase and that's good. And the reason it's good to be wrong in this way is that we always want our plans to be feasible under adverse conditions with room for upside if upside comes. We sold all our bonds, the tax base grew faster, and so our tax rate drops. That's a good thing. If it had gone the opposite way, then our tax rate would be rising. We wouldn't be so happy with that. Does that make sense? So sometimes it's good to be wrong on the right side of the line. Um, so we like to be wrong in a conservative way. And so our average for Measure K um, uh, was uh, um, our, our max was 30. We projected an average of 29.95. We've been at 22.91 average is our, our, including what we've experienced and what we project through the end. So what's the story to be told here? I don't worry so much about Measure W. That was a long time ago. You know, I wasn't involved in the planning. Maybe some of you were, your parents were, you know, it was a long time ago. But um, Measure K is pretty recent and we have a success story to tell and I think we should tell it. And we don't need to wait until we're considering another bond to tell it. We should just share with people, they're paying a lot less taxes. And I will say that one of the, um, I won't call it a parlor trick, but sometimes I'm in a social setting and somebody says to me, I pay too many, too much property taxes. So I always say, how much do you pay? And do you know that no one has ever told me? Because they actually don't know. But I know how to look it up so I can look up everyone if I want to. Um, it's, it's actually public record. You can look up any property if you want to. Um, but my point is that sometimes people just have a feeling and we like to give them information if, if they're open to it. Sometimes they're not. But, um, I, you know, I don't want people to, to think, oh, yeah, we have that taxes. It's so much. I want them to know we have a real success story. And the success story is not just that people are paying less than projected. It's all the facilities that were provided. And obviously that's, that's your story to tell to get people on campus and let them see the, the, um, the, the improved facilities and, and see the kids in the facilities. I love seeing that movie. Um, so let's look at page 10. So we have a lot of room left in our statutory bonding capacity if we wanted to consider another bond and we get more capacity as we pay down our principal from our existing bonds and the tax base increases because the statutory limit is a percentage of our tax base. So any questions about that or shall I keep going? Okay, let's, let's go to the next page. So we have this community facilities district that is, and we'll go to the next page, sorry, why? Um, and it's, it's administered by the Galt Schools Joint Powers Authority. Now, the Galt Schools Joint Powers Authority was a joint effort of the elementary and the high school district. And I think it started out really great, but there came a point, and I, this was when during Lois's term as the chief business official, we realized this is coming to its end of its useful life, <laughs> you know? And it kind of reminds me, um, oh yeah, my assistant is still here. So she helps me with a lot of things because the driving is hard. And I, I gave her a pair of shoes that I had a hole in the sole and she took them to a cobbler and she sent me a text and she said, Lori, it's time to lay these to rest. And <laughs> I said, did the cobbler say that? Or are you saying that? She said, I'm saying that. Um, and I could feel that tone in her text. <laughs> so I, I we came to the conclusion that this JPA needs to be laid to rest. It has lived its life. The CFD provided a lot of facilities. The taxes are, the bonds are, are almost repaid. They're going to be repaid in November. There's no need to tax and there's no need if we don't have the CFD to have the JPA and it costs money to administer it. So we want to be saying goodbye. But in the meantime, it was a success story. 
uh, the district had $12 million of bonds that um, improves Moringa Ranch, Lake Canyon, McCaffrey, Galt, and Liberty Ranch. So good story, but we're moving on from that. So we'll go to the page 13. Um, I mentioned that the bonds are going to be paid in November. And so again, we have an item to kind of celebrate. People aren't going to pay those taxes anymore, right? So there's kind of a generational change going on. And you can see that, right? Things that were done in the 90s and the early 2000s, the community had really started to grow and there was an effort to fund facilities. And now those things are coming to an end and we're in a new era, not, not just because of post-COVID and, and I have a new dog, but you could use those things as your markers if you like. So we'll go to the next page. We'll go to the next page after that. So the traditional sources of school facilities funds, you know, across the state, the state has a school construction program. It's always hard. It's, it's, I don't think anybody would say it's clear, right? We do our best to get the money that we can, but the they call it a 50% program, but then they don't pay 50% of every dollar you spent. So it's not a 50% program. You can get allocated money and not actually receive any money. I mean, so, you know, you say, well, what does the word allocation mean? And it means that, well, we said you'll get money and maybe you will later. And that's what allocation means, which seems to be the same status that you had before they gave you an allocation, right? You might have qualified. So it's a very hard thing. And, and I think Galt has done a very good job of staying on top of it, has a good consulting um, team there that works on the state funding. And But the key there is that local matches are required. And so if we were to consider another bond, we would have the opportunity to match our local money with state money. So that allows our local money to go further. And there's another way of thinking about it, which is that if Galt doesn't pursue that state money, it goes to another district and the taxpayers in our community still pay for it. So we should try to get it and we need that local match to make it work. Now, developer fees are slowing down and that's an interesting aspect, right? Housing prices are rising, but developer fees are slowing down. So there's some obvious economic factors that I bet everybody knows, right? The mortgage rates are really up. Interestingly, the municipal bond rates are where they were pre-COVID, so they're not up that high, but the mortgage rates are up high. And we have a lot of people who come to, to Galt and other communities in this region because they can sell a home in the Bay Area, get their equity out and move here and they don't need a mortgage. So that the fact that the mortgage, you know, would normally, the mortgage rates being up would normally bring housing prices down. We haven't used up all the money that's coming from that purchase money or that equity that's coming and becoming a new purchase. Does that make sense? And so there's kind of a runway on that. At some point that runway can end, but that's still happening as those prices are going up in other places and people, they can come to such a wonderful community and get a, a nice home here. And, and maybe they had a mortgage there. They don't need to have a mortgage here. So we all know those stories. Um, and then how do we get money from the local community? So in the past, we did the CFD thing, with the, which was developer driven, but geo bonds really come from the local community voting on them, but they also reflect something that people do seem to like the Prop 13 differential, right? That if you've lived in your home a long time, you have that lower assessed value, so your tax rate's not going to be that high. So nobody really has to argue, hey, if this bond passes, I'm going to be forced out of my home, right? Um, and the other interesting thing about geo bonds, which, which I think is valuable, economically speaking, is all the assessed value in the community pays for the bonds, not just the homes. In the CFD, it's the residential property that's being taxed. So we get more value. I mean, I think all property benefits from good schools. So we get, uh, let me say it this way, the residential homeowner kind of gets a subsidy from all the other properties, if, if that makes sense. I mean, maybe that's not a, the best word choice, but just to kind of illustrate. So let's go to page 16. So community facilities district bonds can be done district wide um, or in a, in, a, in a populated area that is a subset of your district and they require two thirds voter approval. So normally that's not how they're done. They're, they're, there is a nearby district that is called Elk Grove that has a district wide CFD that was formed. And I, I was part of that um, 25, 30 years ago. Okay. And they did that because geo bonds were not as available then. Okay. It was a legal thing. But my point is it's unusual to do a voter approved CFD because 
you can tax on any basis except ad valorem. And typically people go to, to do it per unit, per home, per parcel, per something like that. And you actually don't get the subsidy that you get to the residential homeowner through the ad valorem approach. Plus you get that Prop 13 striation that you wouldn't get. So that's why the geo bonds are more popular. And um, you can do them. I like how we say newer 55% voter approval since 2023 years ago. <laughs> um, but when you compare it to 1910, it seems newer. But the, the point is that lower voter threshold means that that geo bonds generally pass at pretty high rates. And they're a little more flexible. Furniture, equipment, and technology are allowed, but they do have a tax limitation. The max is $60 per hundred thousand for a unified district, which is then when you have a union district like we have, it's 30 and 30. So together it's per measure, it's, it's not gonna be more than 60. Um, and there's, as you know, a bond oversight committee. Um, so let's look at the next slide. And I think this is important is to look at how the measures have failed. So this is going back to the 2010 primary. And you can see that up until 2016, look at the, well, I, there's a few exceptions, 67% um, in 2012, but you see very high rates of passage. And then you see what happened after 2016. You know, I think the politics really changed and people's feelings changed. And here's another thing that I feel people often think with a school bond measure is they really think it's about us, but what people think is not necessarily just about us. It can be about a larger political environment, and it can also be about neighboring districts. There's kind of a contagion. If neighboring districts are also having school bonds and it's a very positive story, people may be inclined to vote for your, they take it as a whole, right? School bonds and they're good, or it could go the opposite way, school bonds and they're not good because there was some negative story. So I just remind you, as you think about uh, community involvement, like with the school bond, every person who knows you actually knows a lot about the school district because they know there is a school board right? We have people who come from other countries, the governmental system is different, or this is this is the only time they've ever had children and had a reason to even know that there was a school board, right? Their understanding of how things work. And we have to, and, and I will tell you in that 2016 election, I remember that very well. I happen to live in a college town and I have a group of college students that I was having dinner with every, every Sunday night. And so as the election was approaching, I said, so is everybody signed up um, and going to vote? And they're like, oh yeah, voting. Can I can I vote online? And I'm like, well, we can get you registered online. And then they say, and then what? And then I said, and then you go to the polls. So <laughs> they, they didn't know that, right? Now, why didn't they know it? Well, because they live in a computer world. They can do everything on their phone. So the idea that I'm telling them, no, no, you actually go to, and they're like, what is a poll and where is it? And I'm like, well, in my neighborhood, but I don't know in your neighborhood. So they don't have that experience. Try and ask a young person if they can mail a letter, right? They're not even really familiar with like the stamps and stuff. Um, so my point is we, we, we are in a different world. We need to modernize. And, and, uh, and, and so obviously you're, you're, education staff are on the front lines, but you really see the change in what happened with the school bonds, right? And so um, you can see that um, the 2022 primary, well, actually you can go back to the 2020 primary and you can see the voter approval rate really dropped, but then it's starting to, it, it went way up. Um, I'm sorry, in 2020 primary it was down in 2020 general, it went way up. And one of the interesting things that I've observed is when there are um, very positive messages from state measures because they advertise a lot, that can be helpful. So um, the general elections seem to do better, right? And and my own feeling, and maybe because I'm just, you know, I like to think this way, I think when the environment is positive, school bonds do better. And when the environment is kind of negative, not so much. But, you know, you guys, you run for office, you have your thoughts. So I encourage you to to do your own thinking, but I just want to share some more data with you on page 18. You can see that in Sacramento County, we've had a really good passage rate, but um, um, I think people have been pretty thoughtful in Sacramento County. There are some counties that I would say are more urban and people just put bonds on the ballot and figure, well, if it fails, it fails. I think in this county, people really do listen to the taxpayers, the community members, and of course, in a bond measure, you know, we're reaching beyond 
the normal people that are in our boardroom, right? Like normally we have parents and our staff, that's who knows what's going on. And in a bond measure, you're reaching beyond that. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next page. And this is, I think another interesting point, our taxes for Galt Elementary School District are some of the lowest in the county. And we have some of them rolling off, right? So we have a good story to tell that people have supported, they have gotten value for it, and they're not paying as much as their neighbors. Now there's, I know there's marketing people who have a way of saying that, right? Like, you know, you're paying less than your neighbor or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I just want you to think about this because we're not near a date where we should be considering a bond measure, but I just want you to be thinking about some of these facts that are true for people who live in Galt. And I think we should tell our story. So next steps, um, I'm going to just keep on going to page 21. Thank you, Kawhi. You're doing a great job of keeping up with me. Um, and so our most recent facilities master plan was completed in 2015. And when we started talking about that, I was like, 2015, it seems like another lifetime ago, right? Because of COVID. So it identified $150 million of facility needs. Then we had our measure K in 2016. So we addressed some of those. But obviously, if we were to update that facilities master plan, I think we're going to see some pretty big numbers because things have continued to, to wear out. But I think we do need to have some kind of facilities update because we want to be able to confirm in a nice document that the prior needs that have been completed, new needs that have arisen, prior prioritizing critical needs. Um, we need to discuss enrollment and demographics. You know, the community isn't necessarily sensitive to the declining enrollment, like you were talking about the combo classes, which has to do with declining enrollment. And people who are in the schools know that you have a combo class, right? But parents whose kid is not in a combo class might not know about it, right? Um, and then what does the general public know? And somebody out there is going to say, well, my grandfather went to a school and they had kindergarten through eighth grade in the same classroom, right? So whatever. My point is that there's information that people wouldn't know. And if we have a nice document that we can present, and it doesn't have to be an old fashioned document with the plastic binding on the side. It could be a document that's made for the web, you know, that provides the interesting information and updates people as to what is going on and provides some sense of budget estimates. And the other thing about doing a facilities master plan is it's an opportunity for staff and community collaboration. So you have the site users, which are the people who work there and go there on a regular basis and know what the campus looks like and what's going on there. And then there's a lot of people who are aware there's a school there and um, they're aware there's a school there, but maybe the last time they were on that campus was 15 years ago when their kid went there. So they don't, they just don't know what it is. They've had no reason to go. And then there's other people who would be like, there's a school there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right around the block, you know? So this, the facilities up um, planning update is an opportunity to reach out and get people involved in something that is valuable um, to them. And one thing I always say about citizen collaboration, I always want to make sure that any citizen collaboration we do is feasible for them to do as citizens, right? We don't expect them to have professional expertise. We expect them to be able to do it as a volunteer. So feasible for them to do given, given who they are and impactful. There's no reason to get people involved if we're not going to listen to them. So the reason I'm bringing this up is you, we don't need to walk around our schools and figure out all the money that is needed if we're not going to be responsive to what that tells us. Does that make sense? Um, and, then, and, and on the flip side, it's also why we don't need a facilities plan that has pictures of schools in Denmark or you know schools that look like college campuses because that's not what we're going that's not what we're going to have here right so we need to have a realistic community based effort that supports us and be prepared that if it comes back and says it's great all the things you've done over the last 25 years over the last 10 years but here's what's needed that that becomes a call to action and we'll we'll pick it up from there so I hope the superintendent and chief business official are happy with what I presented. Um, uh, they'll tell me tomorrow, if not, and <laughs> um, be glad to answer any questions. Thanks. You've uh, shared a lot of information. Wow. Well, I can't believe it's been since 2015 already since no. master plan. <laughs>
Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. This was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, it's an honor to be on your team and we'll be back as needed. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. Moving on to other reports, number two, the Williams Uniform Complaint Process. Um, there are no complaints to report. All right. Okay. Moving on. On to item H, routine matters, new business. Do we have any um, donations? We have no donations. Um, no, I. When we get to personnel, do you have a um, something to highlight there? Um, we do have a retirement. Tammy Wool that has retired um, after 34 years in our district. She has worked in a school office, started as an office assistant, and then been a secretary in our school offices for 34 years. So we wish wish her the best. And she has already moved on. Her last day was March 31st. Oh, yeah. She the lady that when you entered to the first one there on the left on the no she's the principal secretary in oh, the back okay mm -hmm. oh she used to be yeah okay okay good 34 years That's mm -hmm. long time yes <laughs> okay and then on the consent calendar the other only other thing i wanted to highlight so it gets in the minutes is item e we had a typo on the wording on the company there um, what's in the consent calendar is a proposal for overhaul construction for exterior portables renovation. And E says BT Mancini. We'll be bringing BT Mancini to you next month in the consent calendar. So it's just it's the name. The background information is accurate. What you have is the estimate for or the proposal from overhaul construction. They were the lowest bidder, so we don't have any conflicts there. But that is overhaul construction for the exterior portables renovation at one hundred and nine thousand five hundred dollars. All the back out background is accurate. Okay. Um, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar. Catherine? I'll second. Thanks, Annette. Thank you. I have a motion from Catherine Harper to approve item number 212440, seconded by Annette Kunze. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Tracy Skinner? Aye. Casey Raboy? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Moving on, get on to 212.442, 442, uh, board consideration approval of the audit report by Christy White and Associates. That'd be me. So we have um, our partner from Christy White on Zoom to uh, go over the highlights of the audit. So each year, Ed Code requires us to have an independent financial and compliance audit. And so Michael Ash is here and um, just wanted to point out that the district had no findings um, this year for our audit. Mm -hmm. And she, Kawhi is gonna, I hear you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, good evening. Can you, can you see and hear me? Uh, Kawhi is working on seeing you. Okay. I, hear you. I can, I can see myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're fine. Yeah, we okay, Michael. Since we can hear you, we'll go ahead and just have you start. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm going to keep my presentation. I actually have two audit reports to present, so I'm going to keep it very brief um, in the essence of time. Um, so, this is the um, annual independent audit as of June 30th, 2022. Uh, normally, we would have been presenting this um, audit in January. 
Um, the district did have to file an extension, not for anything that the district did wrong. Um, they noticed some errors in their P2 reporting, but the CDE's website was not available until March. So we had to push off the audit until the end of March. Um, so the, the independent audit looks at a few things. Um, the first opinion that we give is on the financial statements themselves. Um, we gave the district an unmodified opinion. That means in our independent auditor's opinion, the financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects. Uh, that's the best opinion that you can have. Uh, because you're a school district, we have to do your audit or what's called government auditing standards. If we come across anything that we deem to be a significant deficiency or material weakness in internal controls over financial reporting, uh, that has to get reported as an audit finding. Happy to say we didn't have any audit findings there. Um, the next opinion we give is uh, the federal opinion. It's called a single audit because a district spends over $750,000 in a year. Um, there's certain programs that we have to pick based on the dollar amount and how long it's been since we tested them. And again, unmodified opinion on federal, uh, no findings. Um, and then finally, there's a state compliance opinion. So there's a state audit guide that's updated every year. Um, we have to look at everything from your attendance to your instructional minutes, um, instructional materials, public hearing, school accountability report card, CalPads reporting, um, just a lot of things that we have to look at each year. Um, and again, with state awards, unmodified opinion, and uh, no findings were noted. Um, I just want to thank the entire team there. Um, this is my sixth year as being the audit partner uh, for Gald, and there have been uh, numerous people in the different roles, and no matter who it's been, uh, whether it be our audit contact, whether it be the chief business official, the superintendent, um, the district has always had um, a great consistency uh, of having good audits, good clean audits, and the audits have always run very smoothly. Uh, the district has always provided everything that we've needed in a timely manner, and I wish I could clone them and they could train some of the other school districts uh, <laughs> how to do it. So, um that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, question. Um, usually on the audit report, it's like the main rephrasing is, or the thing is, they, uh, they would come and say, hey, like, I think it's page 81. Is that like the uh, the findings of the audit, like the main finding, findings? Uh, yeah, would that be the summary, summary of audit? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when I come in person, I always present that one page. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, presenting on Zoom is not as conducive, and okay. I, I'd rather be there. But yes, as a board member, if you're only going to review one page of the audit report, that's definitely the one to look at, because mm -hmm. um, that gives you the rundown of the audit results themselves. And we had a good one, right? No no significant findings, correct? Uh, no findings at all. That's no. correct. Uh, all unmodified awesome. opinions and no findings. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? All right, so, you know, we'll get a, uh, I can get a motion to approve uh, the audit report. I'll make the motion to approve item 212.442. All right, thank you, Tracy. And I get a second? I'll second. All right, thanks, Casey. Thank you. I have a motion from Tracy Skinner to approve item number 212442, seconded by Casey Raboy. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Annette Kunze? Aye. Catherine Harper? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, then we'll move on to 212.443 with uh, Measure K bond audit. Okay, um, so I'll be presenting this one um, as well. So this is the um, June 30th, 2022 Measure K uh, Financial and Performance Audit. And this is the last audit for Measure K. Um, this was the, the final year um, that funds had to be spent and um, was zeroed out. And it was a very light year. Um, there were only a few, there were only a few dollars left in um, Measure K, um, but still had to do the audit because all the funds had not been expended yet. So with a Prop 39 bond that Measure K is, um, you have to do performance, financial and performance audits until all the funds have been spent. The financial audit procedures are very similar um, to what we do for the district audit, only they are just over uh, the Measure K fund. And then the performance audit is, that is looking at the expenditures and comparing those to the ballot language and facilities master plan and just making sure that those expenditures are um, in allowance with the ballot language um, and the facilities master plan and the, the project that the district said that they were going to have within the bond. So um, with the financial audit for uh, Measure K, we had, again, an unmodified opinion, 
and no findings. And then also with the performance audit, uh, we pick the sample of expenditures. Um, if it's earlier in the bond, we'll look at some of your contracts. But since this was at the very end of the bond, there were no contracts that were approved for Measure K. Um, but we also gave an unmodified opinion um, on the performance audit as well. So that's all I had for that audit. It was, like I said, the expenditure amount was very small um, activity during 2022. And this will be the final audit for Measure K. Um, so are there any questions that I could help answer? And none. No questions. Thank you very much. Thanks okay, well, thank you. Reports. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, are the, uh, since uh, the measure case uh, finishing up here, uh, can make make sure to thank the uh, all the parents and the business organizations and everybody that was involved with the- Yes, definitely the oversight committee. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, can I get a uh, motion to approve the Measure K bond uh, audit? I'll make a motion to approve the Measure K bond audit. Awesome, thank you, Annette. Okay, can I get a second? I'll second. Awesome, thank you, Casey. Thank you, I have a motion from Annette Kunze to approve item number 212443, seconded by Casey Raboy, Wesley Cagle. Aye. Tracy Skinner. Aye. Catherine Harper. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. All right. Moving on to 212.444 or consideration of approval of the uh, elementary district vision and mission statement. Right. Thank you. We've been working on a mission and a vision statement for a few months now. Last month, we shared a few different drafts with the board. And then we've received more feedback since then. And we've come to the point to where we have one mission and vision that we are bringing to the board. Um, it is something we do have board policy that states that the board does need to adopt this because it is um, our long range vision that sets direction for the district and the, the board needs to approve this. And so we are at a point to where we are bringing this to you and wanna open it up for discussion and then a potential motion. Okay. Um, how long a time frame? Is it year by year that this to be review it yearly or? You know, the board policy doesn't have a time frame. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, it's really up to administration and board direction on how often you want to review this. I don't, I think annually might be a little much because you, you take it through such a process. It's been quite a while. I, I don't even recall how long it's been since we have taken a mission and a vision to the school board, but it would be up to your, your direction. Um, there's not a time frame in the policy. Um, how often do we do the LCAP? That's annually. We have to review, yeah. review it annually. It's on a three-year cycle, but it is review, uh, board approved annually. Okay. Well, the, uh, uh, as you can see, the mission statement uh, it's clearly here. I, I mean, I can reread it right here. Uh, the mission of our district is to promote growth and achievement through innovative educational programs that integrate personal strengths, social, emotional, and an academic learning for all children. Uh, and uh, you have a definition of the uh, mission statement right there as well. Uh, our uh, mission is a public declaration that the districts use to describe their founding purpose and major organizational commitments, i.e. what they do and why they do it. So mission statement may describe a district's day-to-day -day operational objectives and instructional values or its public comments to learners and community. Um, I should ask, do you guys wanna break this down uh, mission statement first and then go to vision statement? Okay. Yeah, but just to clarify, it's one vote, is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So when we do do the vote, it's going to be both subjects are will be one under one vote. So, how does everybody feel about the mission statement? I like the mission statement. Mission statement's good. Okay. Okay. So then we'll go to uh, approach the vision statement. <clears throat> and the definition of the vision statement, as is written here, is. Um, or simply a vision is a public declar declaration that districts use to describe their high-level goals for the future. 
what they hoped to achieve if they, are, if they successfully fulfill their organizational purpose or mission. A vision statement may describe a district's loftiest ideals, its core organizational values, its long-term objectives, or what it hopes its learners will learn or be, or be capable of doing after graduating. And then the mission state, the vision statement, let me get that correct. The vision statement that is written here is our schools create safe learning environments that provide equitable access to engaging opportunities for all children. We foster learning environments for collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking to ensure children are successful in school and in their future. So is there any questions, concerns about the vision statement? I do have a couple of remarks about the vision statement after a lot of thought um, and talking to people and um, just reflecting. I had, um, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to the people who put a lot of work into these two statements and a lot of thought. Um, and like I said before, I think the mission statement is on point. Um, I also think the students of this district have an unusual advantage when it comes to the strengths coaching that we do, and that's emphasized and valued and the individual strengths of each student, because we don't have cookie cutter children. I think we know, you know, all of us know that. Um, that being said, the word equitable gives me concern, and I know we've had discussions in the past of what that word means for our students. Um, I consulted Webster. And I found the standing definition is to deal fairly and equally with all concerned. Um, this is a popular word in education right now. I've been around enough to see that. And um, I have seen real examples of it being used against the interests of students, um, particularly in another district in our area that I have good knowledge of. Um, they also have equity as one of their, um, in their mission and vision and in their ethos. And um, in one example, the quest for equity caused the, not just the trim down, but the removal of advanced and honors classes in the name of equity. Um, in the minds of the people who made those decisions, a class that's not accessible to all students is not equitable and in their minds had to be eliminated. In another case, um, I saw forced enrollment of students in um, advanced placement classes because the powers that be in that school did not like the makeup, how the classes actually were at the time, and they wanted to change the makeup of the classes. So they forcefully enrolled students. They picked out kids who they thought would be successful, and they enrolled them, and even parents came and complained, and they wouldn't budge. Some of those students did really well. Some of them did not have interest in the class, and they didn't do well, and it hurt their GPA. So I know I'm making a big deal about this one word, but I have seen the fallout from the philosophy of that has gone wrong surrounding that word. And it's a popular word, like I said. Now I've been assured, I've talked to Lois, um, our district does not intend to eliminate those advanced classes. Um, there's no no ill intent. I For not one second do I believe that there was a sinister intention with that word. Um, I'm actually thrilled that there's going to be a gate program in the future for our students. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm going to just acknowledge that this, there's not going to be equitable access to that program because kids who don't meet the criteria will not be allowed to enroll in the gate program. Um, I'm concerned that in the future, the word equitable could be used to eliminate these programs. Um, I love our staff here, but I also am realistic in knowing that you're not the decisions may be made by other people in the future that are not in this room. So I don't want to open the door for it to be misused later. And in looking at the vision statement, I think it's very strong. I think you can eliminate the word equitable or find a good alternative that communicates what we're actually trying to do. And what we're actually trying to do is to meet learners where they are. And that's evidenced by our strengths-based approach. Um, every kid has their own strengths and some of them, their strength will be gait or other things. And some of them that won't be, that won't be their strength. And that is okay. 
Um, so that's, you know, those are my words on the, my thoughts on that word. Um, I would be interested to hear the reaction of my other board members. Yeah. Uh, myself personally, uh, as I was reading this and kind of going over it, uh, I kind of looked at how uh, we had stakeholders discuss this, right? We had uh, district advisory committee, what was this other committee? You had the English language, Le English learner advisory committee, the, mm -hmm. the DLAC. DLAC. We had administrators. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we had staff, we had teachers in on this decision. Mm -hmm. So my my issue wasn't well, my issue, but my my uh my thing is we had the stakeholders in this district meet, discuss this vision statement. And from my understanding, this is one that they that they kind of picked, right? Yeah. Did, the, did anybody the, have any concerns when we were when you were discussing this? No, and the equitable access, I mean, that was that statement or that those couple of words were in all three of the vision statements that the committees came up with. I I reviewed that, that it is, yes, it is in all three that the committees did come up with because last month we shared three different samples and equitable, equitable access is in all three of those. So it did, yeah. did come from the committees. Yeah, and it's also in our LCAP goal number one. It's uh, engaging learners in pre-K-8 through a focus on equity, access, and academic rigor with inclusive practices and various learning environments. So for me, just the fact that our stakeholders have had, have, had to have read this, looked at this, discussed this, it's in our LCAP goals. Uh, and for me, as I was reading it, I'm, for me, that word means the children that are going to Valley Oaks, Greer, are going to have the same equal education as the students that are on that side of 99. So I don't know. We might have parents, teachers might be upset with the fact that we don't have that in our language when it's in our LCAP. And uh, like I said, our, our social economic disadvantaged youth, and then you, as which is mostly on this side of which the I'm area one, which is mostly my area, they might it might it might raise some red flags. Is my concern. I don't know how other people. Um, I <clears throat> thank you both for your comments. I know that was very um, spoken from the heart. So I appreciate that both of you guys spoke from the heart. So I'm sort of at the, where I struggle with it is I feel like if you were to ask five different people, like a vision really, you should be able to close your eyes and everyone should be getting to the same place. I don't think equity um, or equitable access provides that same um, vision to everybody. I think even without it, our schools create safe learning environments that provide engaging opportunities for all children. I think that says it all, and it's actually shorter as well. Um, I'm sort of along the same lines that uh, equity, you can ask five different people, and it can also be something in the eye of the beholder. Someone can feel something's equitable while someone on, you know, can feel that it's inequitable to them. So that's where I have concern. I think it reads perfectly good without it. I understand the LCAP goal was, you know, it is part of the LCAP goal. As me as a decision maker was not involved in that process. And had I been, I probably would have expressed the same thoughts at that time. But, you know, it's it's not within my decision making comments as at this time. So I also have struggled with that word. I struggle with it because I, again, while it might be, you know, the definition that Lois provided, which, um, you know, may be the definition some people come to, may be a completely definition when you ask someone what does it mean. And I don't think a vision should create that much um, discussion. I think it should be something that, you know, our schools create safe learning environments that provide engaging opportunities for all children. I mean, that just seems so clear and everyone can visualize that. And I would think most people get to the same place. So that's sort of where my head is at. Um, I mean, and 
I, I would say that my voting would probably reflect that as well, or if I could, you know, propose an alternative, because um, I think even access is, is a little bit, you know, what does that mean? You know, different people have different ideas about what access means. Thank you for my Thank you for time. sharing. When I read it the first time, I think I, taking what you said about, you know, can you get to that place? I didn't change my view when I read it either way. Um, if, I guess what I wanted to maybe ask is, so because we did have the stakeholder involvement and, um, you know, they've provided a, a three, correct? Yeah, we've, yes, there were a combination of, well, there was lots of different versions and we've come up with, we've tried to take all the feedback that we've had over the last couple of months and come up with a couple different drafts, yeah. but that word was, that came up a lot. I mean, I don't really feel comfortable taking it out without, you know, just because there were stakeholder involvement to take it out, just me up here. Do you know what I mean? So would mm -hmm. we go, I mean, we need to have a, a vision statement. Would we vote on this? Would we go back to the drawing board? What does it look like for us? I mean, well, somebody would have to make a motion to either approve as is or make a motion to approve with an amendment, however that amendment might look. Or of course, the board could choose to table and, and say, take it back to the drawing board. We always table it. We could we could have like a little study session type thing. We could have a, a study session. We have, so we can meet and then we could uh, go from there and give you direction. Because mm -hmm. I, well. I don't know at this point about taking it back to the committees. It would be, I mean, what is it? Yeah. Is it a vote? Do you want the word or not? I mean, I wouldn't necessarily. Invest it there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think it's just, it's really up to the board if somebody wants to make a motion one way or the other. Um, I, I, I think. I don't know if. Um, I think we're reading a little too much. I mean, I think the, the vision statement is um, fine. I think they they did a good job. It is in our LCAP. We have stakeholder involvement. We're here just to represent kind of what they wanted and this is what they wanted. Um, I think it's a beautiful statement and I and I don't think saying access to engaging opportunities, I think that's just expressing you know, the educational pathway for the students. I don't think that means we're going to, obviously students have different abilities or, and are going to have different opportunities, but it's about their individual pathway and, you know, helping them on that journey. Thank you, Case. So, I don't know, is anybody... Anything else they would like to add? I I just don't think that I would feel so strongly if I hadn't seen the fallout already um, and the dam the actual real damage it's causing in other places. Um, it's just interesting to me to hear all of you kind of express what it what it means to you. And I love how Casey put it, like the, finding the educational pathway for each for each kid. And I guess I don't. That was never a definition I would have found. Um, but I love that. I'm like, oh, you know, so. <laughs> like, um, this, is, this is a tough one because I like 99% of this, I I love. This It's just hard for me. And, I, you know, I almost feel, you know, guilty because I'm, tor you know, almost torpedoing this with this one little word. Um, and again, I don't, I know I've been around here long enough and I know everybody's heart is for 
engaging, you know, engaging students and their opportunities, I guess, and, and letting them have opportunities according to their skills and what they need and what tools they need. Um, my concern is just when the people who wrote this statement aren't the people making the decisions anymore. And maybe this statement will stand for 10, 20 years. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's one of those statements that can, we can always go back and revisit. Yeah. It's not a set in, set in stone. It's not going to be etched in stone and put on a foundation. It's, it's a living yeah. uh, statement. So we can always go back and revisit. Mm -hmm. so correct. What's, let's say, you know, four years from now, we think, oh, we want to revisit this. Mm -hmm. Is that just something that we bring up? Yeah, anytime. Again, there's no timeline. We can bring this up anytime. And, and, and our LCAP goals are good for one. We will be bringing it to the board in June, but it's a three-year cycle. So those two goals will stay for one more year um, after this next year. And then if the board at that time wants to you know, revisit what the goals are then. So what you're saying is it's possible that we would, uh, maybe even probable that we would look at a vision statement again with new LCAP goals um, or only if we want to. If you want to, I mean, I think why can you remember, I mean, when's the last time that we've formally taken a vision and a mission to the board? I, I can't remember. I don't can't recall remember. a time. Yeah. We've done that. And we don't have anything formally. I mean, some of our flyers that we have just say the vision is gall growing and learning together. That's kind of what our, I think that's kind of more of our slogan. Um, but, and so when we are looking and that's part of what kind of prompted me to talk to our, our partners and engaging partners and, you know, and, and when you apply for things, when people ask you, you know, what's your district about, a lot of times they're asking you, what's your vision, what's your mission statement? And it was probably about six or seven months ago, somebody asked me that from a different organization. And I, well, I don't necessarily think we really have one that I could say, this is it. So I started going through this process with, with everyone. And then, um, you know, digging a little bit, bit with Kauai, it was like, does this have to be board approved or is this just, was it good enough that we took it to the board as a report and she pulled the board policy that we actually have policy that it should be formally approved by the board. So, you know, really you can bring it up, ask staff to bring it up anytime. And maybe it's uh, something that we need to uh, put on the calendar for every year that we look, we look at it every year because it could be a year to year. Mm -hmm. Or or maybe tie it with the LCAP. Okay. When it gets renewed, you revisit you revisit it. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. And as well. that's that would be easier than oh. every year, but every three years maybe. But to me, a vision is something that was supposed to withstand time, and so I don't feel comfortable that this would necessarily withstand time, and I don't necessarily feel like because we, I think even five of us have different definitions on ourselves. I think that it can leave room for misinterpretation. And also, um, I just don't feel comfortable having it lead to some a situation where either someone is saying that the district is not being equitable or also where someone feels that they are being treated inequitably, um, however they feel. Because again, it's in the eye of the beholder to me. So, um, and again, using those examples, I agree today, we all have very well intentions and want the best for our school, but I just, I can't support the idea of maybe inadvertently supporting something like that. And and even with the vote, I mean, obviously the, the board can vote however, you know, they decide, um, but that's just where where I'm at right now. So, uh, you know. Totally, under, uh, totally understand. And that, that's, uh, thanks for sharing. Share your, your opinion. Um, does anybody else have any? I wasn't sure if you were going to speak, but okay. <laughs> I just I'll go real I, quick. So I guess what I'm hearing, what I from uh, West Tracy and Casey is you guys don't share my concern, and that's and it's fine. I'm just trying to understand. You don't share the concerns that I that I outlined. Well, I mean, once you say it, I mean, I see you had an experience where you saw something mm -hmm. or, you know, um, a 
a situation. I think for me, um, I wouldn't have got that, you know, from this. And I think because we can revisit it, if we feel like it, we're going that direction, we can, you know, we can change course. I mean, we could, you know, change it any time. Um, I think that word is, I mean, it, it, yeah. So, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't want to live in fear that it's going to go that way for our district. Do you know what I mean? Um, I do. When I, like I said, when I read this and I, even when you read it without those two words, I didn't change, you know, the vision in my head. Um, I like that we can revisit it if we feel like it is detrimental. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's. For me, it's, it's, uh, as I'm thinking K-8, I'm just thinking like today for the, the, the choir, right? Mm -hmm. So like every kid at every elementary school has that access. So that's a, that's equatable. They have the band is a, a, at every school. There's a band that has band. Any, any kid in the school can participate. Correct. We do have um, band and choir at all of our schools. Cool. Instruments might vary, yeah. but we do. So, I mean, it's, everybody has equal access to that. Um, our sports programs at the, at the uh, K-6 level that they started. I've never, every kid that participates gets to play. That's equal. Everybody's treated equal. I know, because I remember Marengo had 20 kids on their team last year. Every kid got to play. Every kid got to play. Every kid got to participate. Every, that, that's equatable. Now, if we're going to talk the gate programs and stuff, every kid has the, has the opportunity to be in gate. Now, if you have gate, I'm sure it's going to be, you have to test high to be but in game, has but everybody the has that opportunity. To everybody me, everybody has that opportunity second. to take that test, be in that program. So is there a difference between equality and, and equitable? Because I'm hearing equal coming, like those are the words being described, but on paper, I see equitable. And so that's where like the difference of, well, is it the equal opportunity to be able to provide engaging opportunities equally? Because that seems like it would be okay too. So. Um, but equal or, you know, access to everybody. So that's where, I mean, I, I think those are more um, understandable words and more commonly understood. I mean, this is us, but it's the parents and the students. And if you ask a parent, you know, what does this mean? They may not get to the same place as educators. And that's where, but without it, I think they would clearly get there. And I think that's what we see happening at the schools is they're being provided these all to all children. And so I just, I don't know, I guess I don't see the added value of having those words in there if we're saying we're providing those opportunities to all children. It's in that phrase. So why do we need those extra words? Um, and I don't know that those extra words change that meaning any, any way. And if someone can describe how it changes that meaning where we're providing them to all children versus providing equal access, I don't, I, I, or providing access, I don't know that difference. I can't, I can't see that in my head. And there's too much risk for me with that word based on other things that I've seen happen with that word. So. And I think like the mission statement, we all seem like we're all, and that's the, the day-to-day, -day, um, if I'm describing, I'm just, that's like the day-to-day -day what the district is doing. And the vision statement is like, into the future you know what I mean so loftiest ideal yeah so I feel like since we're all kind of in agreement on the mission statement which is the day-to-day -day, what we're doing and we know we can come back if we feel the need revisit both or even just revisit one I'm assuming you know um I feel comfortable with it i'm i mean if somebody is going to pursue litigation it's not going to be about the vision statement that's not going to be part i mean they're just going to bring litigation it's not going to regardless of i wasn't the, talking the about vision station <laughs> i mean but when when you start talking about um you know parents maybe taking legal action about 
equitable situations. I don't think that word in the vision statement is going to matter. I wasn't talking about litigation, so my apologies if that came across. Yeah, it it seems to be, yeah, but we're just talking about, you know, having students access their education. So why do we feel so strongly that words have to be in there? Because um, I think you're right, we could revisit it, but I think the, the issue is, is if we're not up here, then we've put something into place that perhaps isn't being carried out the way it was intended. I think, for and me, I'm not even sure what the intention is. <laughs> I think for me, it's the stakeholder involvement and in the time mm-hmm. that they did, and they all three kind of had that. So I, I don't feel right changing the wording just because of how I, feel. you know what I mean? I feel like, and do I want to start over and do those committees again? I mean, that would, I be- kind of, yeah, the one they. I feel like if we're, if we're gonna do that, it's because we see, hey, this didn't work out. Let's go back to it. Then just not, um, you know, I don't know. That's just my opinion. We've had plenty of time to discuss. I don't know. Do you know how to keep track of how long we've been talking? Deep. It's been for a little while. Should we? I mean, we could just make a motion and see how it goes. Yeah, that's what the next question would be. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make the motion for item uh, the 212.444. Yes. So then that is a motion to approve, correct? Yes. So then can I get a second? I'll second. Okay, so I got KC with the motion and then Tracy with the second. Thank you. Thank you. I have a motion from Casey Ravoy to approve item number 212444, seconded by Tracy Skinner, Wesley Cagle. Aye. Annette Kunze. No. Catherine Harper. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes 4-0 with four A's by Wesley Cagle, Tracy Skinner, Casey Ravoy, and Catherine Harper. Thank you. It was 4-1, correct? I'm sorry, 4-1. Thank you everybody for that discussion. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's tough. Thank it's, you. That's hard, but thank you guys. And it's good to hear different perspectives. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. 212.445, board consideration of approval of environmental and outdoor education coordinator job description. All right. Thank you. So this is a position that um, John Duran or John Galt yeah. <laughs> has been serving for a while, but Although we haven't had a job description for it, John Duran has been serving in this position as a teacher many years ago, maybe 20 plus years. um, Mr. Duran came out of the classroom and continued in this position since he's retired. He has been retired for a few years now. Um, And so what prompted this was really trying to figure out how to fill this position because we want an environmental outdoor education coordinator to receive the value in in it. Um, But we didn't have a job description. And so, you know, John does want to really retire at some point. And so in this process, we have been looking, John, we got John's feedback on this. We consulted with Nature Nature Center's Wildlife Society, Sierra Outdoor School, who has a program similar to like this. And we came up with a job description. It would be an unrepresented classified 10 month position with a salary range of 58,000 to approximately 74,000. The position would start July 1st, 2023. Um, You do not need, this position would not need a teaching credential, um, would definitely need a bachelor degree. And then there's some other requirements there and there's some preferred requirements as well. Um, but the qualifications are really related to a lot of the physical um, qualification and abilities that you need in this position. You're outdoors a lot, you're lifting, you're moving, you're hiking, you're in the elements. Um, you really have to have a desire to want to do this kind of work. Um, we're seeking a bachelor degree in science, um, adventure education, recreation administration, natural history, or any really technical related field. For the position, um, they would also be doing some grant writing and things like that as well. We would fund the position um, 
multi-funded, there'd be grants, expanded learning because it will incorporate after school programs and, and we also use some LCFF funds, general fund for the position as well. Okay, thank you for the report. Thank you for the um, summary there. Uh, it seems like it's gonna be a really good position for somebody who likes the outdoors. <laughs> So yeah. uh, does anybody have any uh, questions? I just think it sounds like a really cool job. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. And it's funny because when I read this, I thought, oh, that sounds like John, what John does. So, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> so whoever takes this is going to have some big shoes to fill. That's for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> so um, any other uh, questions, comments? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the um, environmental and outdoor education coordinator awesome. job description. Thank you, Annette. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thanks, Casey. Oh, I'm sorry, Tracy. Thank you. I have a motion from Annette Kunze to approve item number 212445, seconded by Tracy Skinner, Wesley Cagle. Aye. Casey Raboy. Aye. Catherine Harper. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Moving on to uh, 212.446, uh, board consideration of approval of a MOU between the uh, CSEA uh, Chapter 362 and the Elementary District Bilingual Community Outreach uh, Assistant. Yes, um, currently we have uh, the position of a bilingual community outreach assistant. And so what uh, this position is, is it adds for special programs. Our bilingual community outreach assistant, I'm um, currently in our district support, parent engagement, participation, communication at all of our school sites. They do interpreting for parent and teacher conferences. They attend the events and um, a lot of translations, but we also have the county's largest population of migrant students in Sac County. We have 296 migrant students currently in our school district, and with migrant education, we have funding to support for outreach for, um, for those families, and that also brings with it, as you see in the job description, some added responsibilities. Um, they work on recruiting whenever we have new families move into the area. You know, they, they make sure to communicate to make sure that see if they qualify for migrant um, services. They supply them with resources. They have an office at Fairsight that has packed with just a different resources for our migrant families that could be in need. She also, um, they also facilitate the monthly um, migrant um, parent advisory committee that we meet jointly with the high school. So because of these extra duties, we um, I'm proposing that we uh, create the new job description. It's Bilingual Community Outreach Assistant or BCOA for special programs because of the additional duties. And the funding source is 100% um, from migrant education state funding. Thank you for that uh, report. Um, any questions for Donna? I just had one. Um, I noticed, I, if, as my understanding is primarily Spanish learners. So if there were a need, like in other languages, would this be offered to other migrant education families with different languages? Or you know what? Is it um, any? No, it could. It, it could? They, okay. You know, it's not just, of course, probably 99.9% .9 right. of our migrant families are Spanish speaking. But um, the uh, parent, the liaison, this uh they 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 support all families. And in fact, she's also um, in the same office as our other BCOAs. And so they support families in English and in Spanish. And if we ever need any other type of interpretation, we seek that out. Great. Thank you. It's not it's bilingual English and Spanish, but by no means is it limited to just families of those languages. OK, great. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, because, I mean, it's like Sacramento, right? They have a lot of Russians and. And communicate, yeah, so. No, and, and I just signed a requisition because at one of our IEPs, we needed an interpreter, but it was an Italian interpreter. Mm -hmm. So we did go outside. We went, reached out to our SELPA and we found that interpreter. Yeah. 
Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, can I get a motion for 212.446? I'll make the motion for item 212.446. Thanks, Tracy. I'll second that. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. I have a motion from Tracy Skinner to approve item number 212446, seconded by Catherine Harper. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Casey Raboy? Aye. Annette Kunze? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. All right. Moving on. 212.447. Board consideration approval of superintendent's recommendation regarding implementing board resolution number nine, reduction in particular kinds of service. All right, thank you. On February 15th, um, the board adopted resolution nine to reduce four full-time certificated employees for the 23-24 school year. And board approval is recommended to adopt this action because it is required by law to complete the reduction in force process. Um, but with this action, it's not for certificated employees. It is only two. One of the four um, that, were re that received the layoff notice, one has resigned and accepted a job in another school district. And one has taken a different position in our school district, has moved into a teacher on special assignment. Yeah. And so with this action, it's two certificated positions. And it's really a reflection of declining enrollment, especially at McCaffrey. This was based on um, single subject credential needs at McCaffrey Middle School. Um, in 2017, 2018, we had 930 students at McCaffrey. We currently have 747 down almost 200 students just at McCaffrey in the last, last four or five years. And so um, it was just, it was, it was time to really look at um, what we had to do there to address the loss of students. And so it's, it's two certificated employees that would receive this final notice. That's that enrollment's crazy. We've got 747 is going to get split into two going to Galton. Mm -hmm. Just thinking out loud. Going to Galton, Liberty. Mm -hmm. Classes are definitely getting smaller at the high school. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody have any questions? Terms? Seeing none. Can I get a, a motion for 212.447? Oh, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion to approve. Can I get a second? I'll second. All right. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. I have a motion from Wesley Cagle to approve item number 212447, seconded by Casey Raboy, Tracy Skinner. Aye. Annette Kunze. Aye. Catherine Harper. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Okay. And then 212.448 is a uh, Public notice of the uh, the intent, the initial public notice for the elementary district and uh, to Gall Elementary, fa the faculty association, GFA, about their sunshine. Mm -hmm. you kind of so this is the district notifying the board, the public and GEFA or teachers union um, articles that we would like to negotiate for this next school year. Mm -hmm. This is just informational item. We will need to bring it back to the board for action next month, but we would propose to our, um, negotiate article five hours, article, article seven evaluation procedures, article 12 leaves, article 18 salary, 20 salary schedule and procedures, and article 23, the preschool permit teacher. Yeah. All right. Has anybody had any questions? About the uh, sunshine. All right. Seeing none, we'll go on to two one two point four four nine, and it's the notice for from the uh, faculty association about what they want to notice the sunshine to the elementary district. Yes, and so our teachers union GEFA would like to negotiate Article Five hours, six work year, nine reassignments and transfers, twelve leaves. 13 class size, 18 salary and related appendices, 23 preschool permit teacher, and 24 the term um, living contract. Okay. Yeah. Questions? 
Anything on that? Any uh, public comment or anything? Hello? No, there's no public comment request, Mr. Cagle. Thank you very much. Well, be, uh, it's uh, good to see you guys wanting to negotiate mm -hmm. some of the same items. So it's a, uh, that's a good yeah. sign. Yes. And there's some side letters we have right now that I think we're close to agreement in that we'll look at trying to get that contract language and, and that. So I think there's, there's a lot we're pretty close on. Good. Okay. We can move on from that and then we'll go to, 212.450 board consideration of approval of the following board policies, uh, administrative regulations, exhibit, and bylaws. Okay. Um, we brought this to the board for first reading last month and board direction um, with one of the policies, board policy 9220 related to governing board elections related to the costs for holding a runoff election. With this policy, the board has three different options. Um, if there's a tie, you can decide by lot, you can decide by runoff election, or it can be decided prior to each election. So we were um, tasked to find the cost and we are area five. And so the cost to run an election is a little over, well, it's almost $44,000. $43,412 to run an election. So do you, we're area five? Mm -hmm. So the 43,412? Or is that for each area, right? That's for each area. Okay. So I, I, I'm... Gotcha. That's what I was wondering. So my area, I'm area one. So oh, sorry. I'm 38,466. Within the city. Yeah. Yes. Areas within the city. Okay. So you'd have to add all of that up. No, it'd be just be the area. And yes, just the area where we're running. We, we did, yeah. Yes, just because we would hopefully only have a tie in one area. Yes, yes. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. So it would depend um, on the area. So after reading this, when will we have to decide um, about like, for instance, like Catherine's had a very close, mm -hmm. close vote. So like when, what do we need to decide? When do we need to make that decision? Well, it uh, says that you need to make the decision prior to the election. So I would assume before the election starts, knowing that we're going into an election year, yes. we'd have to make a decision. Okay. Is what. So the election is, so you'd probably have to do it in the summertime before the candidate for the candidates even put in. Or, that that would make be, sense probably to do it before you even have a a, a, a list a of ballots, right? So the only two options are the runoff, which would cost, mm -hmm. or a drawing, drawing. or you if, or some type they, of lot. But they would have to have the exact same votes. Yeah, the county would have to declare it a, a, like the tie. tie. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we really think that's going to happen? Highly unlikely. I mean, yeah. the, the ex I mean, yeah. it has happened. I've, I've it? read about it before where they toss the quarter up and one, <laughs> one candidate yeah. heads or fails or district money on our. Radio. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think too, especially since we're now in a districted five districts voting on their own candidate. I, I mean, I agree. I don't feel good about spending money on a runoff. And also you're going to have a low, like, I think, so it was low turnout for mine. You're going to have an even lower turnout for a runoff. And so as much, I feel bad, you know, advocating for the tie by lot, but at some point you just have to make a decision. Um, and it's yeah, small amount of votes. So that would be my, uh, my thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I don't know if we need to make that decision like right now, but I mean, eventually we're going to have to make that decision. Like when we want to make, make the decision, if you. Right. Cause if you want to approve this, to actually approve this board policy, you, you need to choose one of those options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to make, tonight. We need to make it. A... Yeah. Unless you, <laughs> unless you're not ready to make the decision and you want to pull this one policy. Well, I think so far I've heard nobody wants to do spend extra money. Right. Okay. So it sounds like option one. Then it would be. Okay. Good. And I just wanted to note for the fees and changes, um, there was a, a typo on that. It had the wrong 
wrong middle school, a template that we borrowed oh, from somebody. Yes. And then I also just wanted to, to recommend what we would like to do if the board approves all of these or approves the fees and changes, we wouldn't want to start charging to attend sporting events until next school year. We're almost at the end of the year and wanna make sure we get that change into handbooks. 2023. So it would be, mm -hmm, right. before we would charge for sporting events. Does uh, anybody have any questions, um, comments, or concerns about any of the any of these? Seeing none. Okay. All right. Can I get a motion to approve two one two point four five zero? I can make a motion to approve two one two point four five zero. All right. Thanks, Annette. I'll second that. Thank you. I have a motion from Annette Kunze to approve item number 212450 with option one selected for board bylaw 9220, seconded by Wesley Cagle, Tracy Skinner, Casey Raboy. Aye. Catherine Harper. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, any public comments? No, there are no public comments. Public Mr. comments? Cagle. Does anybody have anything they would like to put on a pending agenda item? Seeing none, if by chance in the next couple of days you guys can think of something, uh, you can either contact me or mm -hmm. just go ahead and contact Lois. And we can get that put on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, just thanks for a good, good, uh, it was a good board meeting. It was uh, a lot of, uh, it was great seeing the students. I always enjoy that. Uh, thanks for Lake Canyon for presenting. Tell us about your school. The housing thing is great. Uh, and once again, thanks for the board for good good discussions. All right. It's, uh, it was a good day. Thank good you. And thank you, Wes, for inviting us. And thinking of that, I want to say thank you again for having the people here. Um, can I take a second, too, because I see yeah. three principals. I've been doing some site visits. I know some others have as well. So three of you are here today. I'm making the rounds. I'm going to Valley Oaks on Friday. So really enjoyed um, coming out. So I really appreciate um, you hosting us. So thank you. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Our yeah, we got stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Quam, still in your pit.